Good afternoon and welcome to the part six webinar. So I have to start with saying what an absolutely fantastic response Landor have had to this. I think we've, we're maxed out over 550 attendees. So I'm quite confident this is due to the stellar lineup and content that you're about to hear uh, and obviously not because of me. Um, I'd like to kick things off with a brief history, if I may. So 13 years ago, the Traffic Management Act was implemented. And part six gave primary powers to enforce moving traffic contraventions, such as making band turns, exceeding weight limits, and obviously stopping in yellow box junctions. However, only some of the powers were enacted for authorities outside of London under secondary legislation. The DFT is now in the closing stages of laying the secondary changes needed that will allow authorities across England and Wales the opportunity to adopt the breadth of these enforcement powers. Um, interestingly, in 2019, so pre-pandemic, if you can remember back then, the LGA undertook a survey of councils across England, outside of London, uh, and over 90% of respondents said their authority would consider using the full powers of Part 6. Um, if it was available, 95% said to improve safety and 92% to improve and reduce congestion. Importantly, 67% of respondents said that the police do not currently actively enforce any moving traffic offences within their local authority area. Marston will be sharing a toolkit after this session to everybody who has attended. It is not intended to be exhaustive. Obviously, this is a, an evolving situation as you're going to hear shortly from the DFT. We hope it will be a helpful document that supports decision making within your authority. Um, we're happy to be contacted for any guidance or advice if further questions arise over the course of adopting and implementing these powers. I'd like now to introduce you to the speakers. We have a stellar lineup, as I've said, um, for you this afternoon. And opening the batting is Mr. Richard Crease, who is Senior Policy Advisor for the DFT. And Richard will be introducing the changes that are happening and what you as local authorities need to be aware of. Then we have a joint presentation from Ollie Miller, who is Associate Director of Parking at Project Centre, and Oliseni Koya will be talking about considerations, particularly around scheme design and traffic orders. Um, they've both worked within local government for over 20 years, and they, they now support many authorities across the UK. Andrea Jones is Director of Strategic Accounts at Marston, having joined the team following 15 years working within parking at the London Borough of Camden. Andrea will be talking about the practical side of preparing to introduce enforcement. Stuart Scott then picks up the baton, and Stuart is Strategic Account Director for VidiAlert. He has 17 years highways experience in public and private sector, and he was Head of Highways for Blackburn with Darwin Council, so he's well placed to introduce CCTV certified devices and how they are most effectively deployed. Lastly, and by no means least, we have Phil Hall, who is Assistant Director of Parking for London Borough of Barnet. And Phil has over 15 years experience in parking and traffic management roles across London authorities. And he's going to talk about the role of CCTV enforcement in local government and how Barnet have come to use this effectively to support their strategic ambitions. <clears throat> I'd like to now pass over to Mr. Richard Crees, but before I do, quick Richard, if I may, if you could please use this opportunity, everybody, to ask questions, it's extremely important. We've got over 500 people. If we don't get to it, each and every person individually, we will contact you after this webinar, and it will be uploaded onto various different social platforms by Landor. So over to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, and with over 550 people, it's uh, it's great for us to be able to um, reach such a big audience and, and let you know where where things stand um, with the Part Six powers. Um, just to kick off, as you know, last July the Prime Minister committed to introduce the Part Six powers outside London, uh, and this was announced in the policy statement: gear change, a bold vision for cycling and walking. And the, the, the general thrust of the policy is to strengthen local authorities' enforcement powers, both to promote active travel and improve air quality through reduced congestion 
uh, which would also bring benefits to uh, bus punctuality as well. The situation we're in at the moment is work is well underway on a set of four statutory instruments which we have programmed to come into effect at the end of 2021 calendar year. And these, effectively, the structure of these um, SIs will mirror the, uh, the existing structure for civil parking enforcement. Uh, and this is in terms of evidence, uh, enforcement of penalties, income and expenditure, and adjudication, as well as setting penalty, penalty charge levels, um, setting requirements for camera equipment to be approved by the Vehicle Certification Agency, as well as setting the procedures for representations and appeals. As with CPE, once the regulations are in force, local authorities will be able to apply for a designation order to enable them to begin enforcing the Part 6 powers on the ground. An advice, an advice note was issued in August to all local authorities in England outside London, and the aim of that was to help them use this interim period um, to progress their applications as far as possible. As with civil parking enforcement, designation orders will sweep up multiple local authorities to minimise legal drafting um, burdens, uh, administrative burdens, and um, the, the pressure on parliamentary time. This may be done, this may need to be done in stages, uh, depending on initial uptake. We will aim to lay the first designation order in early 2021, but of course, this is subject to um, parliamentary availability in their timetable. To coincide with the regulations coming into force, We'll also issue statutory guidance to local authorities, setting out how ministers expect the Part 6 powers to be used. And it's worth just making the point that statutory in, under the Traffic Management Act, local authorities must have regard to um, the detail of statutory guidance. Um, it's a public document, so uh, the general public can use this should they decide to challenge. Um, any PCN issued to them, uh, and it's also true that adjudicators um, refer to this document as well in considering um, cases that come as far as that. So, um, ministers are clear that the imperative to the success of moving traffic enforcement is ensuring that the public are properly informed of the enforcement. I'll start again. Ensuring that public are properly informed before enforcement starts and that it's clear to drivers where restrictions are in force at any given location. This will also include, the statutory guidance will also include recommendations for traffic signing to be properly designed and placed. Prior to the introduction of camera enforcement at specific sites, local authorities should consider placing temporary a-frame signs at the final approaches to restrictions or junctions, perhaps uh, to get the message out directly to motorists. Uh, and the guidance will also recommend fixed camera enforcement signing um, as well. To promote compliance by helping motorists understand the seriousness of moving traffic contraventions, ministers are very clear that they will expect motorists to be issued with warning notices. However, um, at a political level, this, the, the, the final points of policy detail are still to be decided on this. So there's nothing I can say in addition to that, other than uh, warning notices will be expected. And if I can turn to the second slide, please, Mark. Um, this, this details more um, what ministers will expect local authorities to do in terms of preparing their applications uh, for a designation order. Uh, and in recognising that uh, in obtaining civil parking enforcement, local authorities went through quite an arduous um, uh, set of requirements, uh, we, we've tried to streamline the process as far as we can, uh, and as far as ministers are happy for us to, um, 
So rather than a formal application form as such, um, ministers will just expect a letter signed by the chief and the chief executive confirming that the um, points A to, A to F that you see on your slide um, has been carried out before the letter has been sent to the um, to the Secretary of State, uh, and you'll be able to look at the um, look at the the points there in, in uh, for yourselves. But I should make the point that points B, C, and D are intertwined. Um, the point being that, as I mentioned earlier, it's imperative that drivers have uh, adequate warning of what's coming and what's planned. And you'll see point B, uh, we require a minimum of six week public consultation on the detail of planned enforcement. This should include the type of restriction to be enforced and the locations in question. However, I need to pause on this point because there's been a little bit of um, query on this. When we talk about consultation, we are we are talking in terms of publicizing um, the plan, what, what is planned. We're talking about location and enforcement type. What we're not asking you to do is seek public's views on whether or not enforcement should happen. Uh, we think we'd probably know the answer to that question anyway. So this isn't, an inf this isn't supposed to be um, about an, uh, consulting on whether, whether people like enforcement. It's going to be the detail, location, uh, restriction type, and is to communicate this to people and business, uh, to individuals and businesses, and give them the opportunity to comment. So we were using the term consultation slightly looser. What we're not asking for is newspaper advertising um, that you'd associate with uh, the TRO process. This is about Giving local, giving local residents the opportunity to comment. Perhaps uh, they might think that a, junk, a particular junction is designed as such that if camera enforcement commenced there, that they wouldn't have any choice but to contravene the restriction. So we're asking that such, such issues, if the public have any such concerns, that the local authority under, under point D there give, uh, gives it due consideration. Um, and satisfies itself, and, 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 and just again by promoting buy-in to the to the enforcement regime. Um, authorities should use effective communication um, as they see fit. They might want to use the local press. We're not saying that you shouldn't. Um, email newsletters, perhaps social media, whatever digital means you you that they have of, of communicating to get the message out um, and, as I say, to allow people to comment. We say that this should be done at the, at the lead up and shortly after um, enforcement commences, just to reinforce the message so that as many people get the message as possible. As you'd expect, um, ministers will want uh, confirmation that TROs and traffic signs are lawful and robust and will stand up to challenge. Um, that, that really should be a given anyway, but um, ministers expect that declaration to be made. Um, as well as uh, point F, again, the, the regulations require that the Vehicle Certification Agency um, approves uh, any camera equipment used for en enforcement purposes. And I should say that once Local authorities have acquired the powers, should they be successful in acquiring the powers. If they decide to add any other restrictions or expand um, the ge geographic scope of the restrictions, then on applying for the powers in the first place, that we would expect chief executives to undertake to carry out these points A to F in future. However, we will not be requiring any further applications. This is just a once-only application process. Um, statutory guidance will require the, the chief executives carry uh, local authorities carry out these these steps um, 
But as I say, the, the, the Secretary of State is not interested in being provided with a list of locations and a list of enforcement types, um, nor, nor is the Secretary of State interested to receive um, updates, updated lists in future. This is purely for the local authority to determine once they've acquired the powers. So who can apply? Well, schedule, under Schedule 8 of the Act, county councils and individual metropolitan district councils have the option to apply for designation of the Part 6 powers to cover either, either the whole or part of their uh, civil parking enforcement areas. However, ministers will be expecting local authorities to apply for their whole area. Um, this would be to prevent the need for future amendments um, to geographic scope of, um, of, of the civil, of the part six powers. Uh, and this will again save, save the administrative burden um, as well as the parliamentary timetable. I should underline in all of this, that ministers will expect health and or enforcement to be targeted, and I can't stress this enough, only where action is needed. So, for instance, if compliance could be achieved by way of improvements to road or junction layouts, or by traffic signs and road markings, then this should be done first, and the results should be monitoring, monitored before enforcement action is considered. Uh, and again, this point will be enshrined in the statutory guidance. Uh, as Mike said, lo local authorities are long called for these powers, and it's, it's encouraging that there's such an appetite for them. Um, we'd expect that local authorities should be able to justify the placing of enforcement cameras at specific, at specific locations to its cabinet members. Um, and it may may wish to satisfy itself um, of the need to do so by means of perhaps um, accident statistics uh, or congestion data. But again, the, the, this is information that's not necessary to provide to the local, uh, to the Secretary of State when applying for the powers. The list of traffic signs to which the Part 6 powers will apply can already be found in Schedule 7 to the 2004 Act, um, but we have, we will be adding the school entrance zigzag marking um, so that local authorities outside London will be able to enforce this when that marking is placed with the upright up sign. So effectively what we're, what we're doing is creating parity with London um, London local authorities will also be given uh, the missing traffic signs that, they, that they've not been able to enforce um, since they acquired the powers in 2003. So they will be able to enforce um, contraventions of mandatory cycle lanes, um, cycle routes, as well as the uh, buses prohibited traffic sign. So all in all, we, we're creating a, a uniform list of signs, uh, both inside London and out. Um, and I should also point out that London local authorities will be expected to issue warning notices in respect of these new traffic signs. So that means the bus is prohibited sign and uh, those related to cycle routes and cycle lanes. Um, so really in short, we have tried to make the application process as light touch as we can. Um, but the overriding message is that enforcement should be should be targeted where it's needed. Um, we, we will aim to deliver the powers as quickly as we can, which is why we, we, we've given um, the advice note out in August to help use the time before the regulations come into force. So um, yes, we'll, we will get the, the powers to you as quickly as we can. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for that, Richard. What we're going to do, we're going to do the Q&A session at the end because I think uh, you're going to be very, very popular, Richard. So I've had a, quite a few questions already come in. Um, so what I'd like to do is move swiftly on. If we go on to Oliseni and Ollie from Project Centre, and as I say, we will then commence the Q&A at the end of the presentations.
Thanks, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Ollie Miller. I'm Associate Director at, at Project Centre and I'm joined uh, by my colleague Ola Shenny today. Um, at Project Centre, we um, oversee the parking consultancy services for the, for the company, which often includes control parking, zone design, enforcement advice, policy writing, um, fees and charges for, for tariff setting, and, and traffic orders, importantly. So we're going to do a brief presentation today on, on traffic order considerations and also some scheme design uh, considerations in terms of, of part six being brought out. Let me just have the first slide and just by way of a, a brief introduction. Um, so with, with part six coming in, the boroughs outside of London will be able to bring in um, camera enforcement of a, of a lot more contravention types than they can currently. At the moment with, with the traffic order, they can do school key clear markings, um, bus lanes, um, mandatory cycle lanes. But with part six coming in, uh, we can start to enforce with a camera things like uh, banned turns, no entry points, yellow box junctions, and, uh, and pedestrian zones, pedestrian cycling zones, very common type of, um, of way of introducing school streets for those boroughs that have been looking to do that in, uh, recently. But yeah, so we're gonna focus on, on scheme design and, and traffic orders. So if we go to the next slide, my, my colleague Ola will pick up. Good afternoon all. Um, I'm Ola. Um, I'm an associate uh, project center. Um, thanks, Oli. For that. thanks, Oli. Um, so, uh, uh, in this, I suppose a part of this slide is we'll be looking at um, key considerations in terms of uh, of what authorities uh, should consider uh, before um, as, uh, using the enforcement powers um, that we all may be provided under uh, part six of uh, of the TMA. So uh, there, are two, there are two main considerations which we'll be going into and authorities should consider. And these are um, the traffic orders, on traffic order elements, and from the scheme designs elements as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, from the traffic order elements, um, currently authorities do have a number of restrictions which they're able to enforce without a traffic order. This include uh, box junctions, uh, school keep clear uh, restrictions as well, uh, and some signs on the um, uh, section 36 of, of, of the Road Traffic Act. However, um, quite a number of the moving traffic restrictions uh, do require a valid traffic order to enforce them, um, such as your ban turns, as, as, as mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, your, your, your no entries, uh, your ban turns and no entries. Um, and uh, under part six, um, these can be enforced. Um, as all, all types of traffic orders uh, can be enforced. So uh, section under sections uh, your one, section six, section nine, 14 and 16A of the traffic act. So these will be your temporary, your experimental traffic orders and your permanent traffic orders. Um, some key considerations uh, which uh, authorities uh, need to consider before uh, using I suppose those powers are ensuring that your traffic orders which underpin the, uh, these restrictions are robust and accurate um, and actually um, describe uh, accurately what the restrictions are uh, and uh, also compliance with the traffic order procedures. So ensuring that um, the relevant procedures, the statutory procedures have been complied with before uh, making the traffic orders and implementing the restrictions. Um, also communication with stakeholders ensuring that all the relevant stakeholders, there'll be businesses, residents, or all who may be impacted are communicated with and uh, fully understand uh, the measures and restrictions that are coming, are coming in place. Um, also, uh, considering the exemptions to the design. So where design the scheme, factor in uh, exemptions which may also uh, need to be included within the traffic order or those or the parties who may be exempt to those restrictions. For example, your um, emergency services um, or, uh, certain, uh, or, or certain groups of protected groups um, who, who may need to use uh, that, that route. Um, also, practicality of enforcement, consider the scheme itself and is it practical or with the scheme design, does it suit uh, enforcement? I suppose looking at all angles and all parameters of that and ensuring that, you know, um, where it is deemed uh, to, uh, or where the authority does want to ensure it, ensuring that the scheme is 
clear enough and can be um, easy enough to be described in the traffic order and clear enough to, uh, to be enforced. And lastly, uh, as uh, Gilman is ensuring you leave enough time for the traffic order process. Of course, that relates to my uh, to the second point earlier, um, higher up, which is uh, ensuring that not just complying with the procedures, but when you're planning out the program of your scheme, um, ensuring that there's enough time to uh, comply with the traffic order process and procedures, so your statutory consultation and dealing with any objections if it's a per permit order or that may that that may um, follow. Next slide, please. Um, now going to the uh, design considerations. Another uh, is, is uh, this is another element that um, authorities should consider uh, as a whole. I suppose not just in part, but look at that together with the traffic order. But uh, looking at design element by uh, itself, um, the, the aim of any scheme should be to um, not penalise not just road users, but to, not to penalise but to educate essentially. So bearing in mind. Um, skin should be designed to be clear and simple as possible, so easy to understand for all road users essentially. So using clear and compliant signage, so compliant I mean, with the regulations in the TSRGD. Um, consider advanced warning signs where possible, um, you know, um, not to, <laughs> not going as far as possible and putting them on every but ensuring that they're, they're put in, uh, uh, you know, clear positions so drivers or other road users uh, can, can see them are visible enough and you know ensuring that they, they, they can easily understand um, the changes that have happened. Um, consider the impacts of design changes on wider um, surrounding roads or, or areas or the area itself. Um, so I'm sure um, a lot of authorities do this already, a lot of yourselves do this already when designing schemes um, but just ensuring that these impacts you know um, are not just considered in isolation but to the wider area because um, the impacts of displacement, for instance, and how those can be managed. Um, uh, internal decision processes, ensuring that these are followed, uh, and you know, because at the point, especially uh, from uh, at the point when the scheme is introduced, they could the, the, um, these these processes could be uh, called into question. So ensuring that these are followed and es essentially it's clear, uh, the decisions are clear are clear as well. And a method of control, so um, physical restrictions versus cameras. So um, there's uh, quite a few authorities as, as use um, physical restrictions at the moment uh, versus, I suppose, um, AMPR or enforcement um, is, is considering which one is the best or most suitable for the scheme. Um, whether within London for authorities, so some authorities that, that, that uh, for some authorities, um, emergency services have. Uh, have seem to have a preference, especially for uh, AMPR enforcement, and that's just because of response times and showing that, that that allows them to be exempt from any restrictions in those roads, depending on the type of restriction. So it's um, um, I, I suppose those kind of the, those, those kind of elements are um, good to factor in when designing the scheme as to the ultimate goal in terms of enforcement, how it will be enforced. Um, next slide, please. Right. Um, just uh, this is a a, a, um, a design, essentially uh, a, a example design of a, um, a road closure bus gate that is intended to be enforced by an authority. And the reason why I'm showing this essentially is uh, uh, how this sort of um, we were talking about uh, designs and key considerations. So um, some of the key considerations ensuring that um, there are clear signs um, which are visible. And um, in situations like this, ensuring that these link in with the traffic order. So it's not uncommon to have the description um, in some traffic orders ha um, um, describing um, a, a prohibition with, you know, with exemptions for possibly buses, but where but the restriction here and the signs clearly points to signify to a bus gate. So it's just ensuring that whatever description is in your traffic order, the, um, uh, the um, clear signs or the ready the signs which relate to that restriction or the correct signs are used. Okay. Um, yes. Um, and I'll hand back to my colleague Ollie. To um... thanks. On, so on the on the next slide, there is uh, just our final uh, sort of 
top tips and a bit of a recap. So um, what we've talked about there was was designing with with drivers and road users in mind. Um, I know uh, Richard from DFT talked about promoting awareness and you know very much along the same lines. You want a driver or a motorist to be able to turn up at the restriction and you know reasonably understand what what we're expecting them to do. Um, so do do keep that in mind when when designing. Uh, we're talking about factoring the traffic order process. I mean that that process is is long established, uh, set in stone, and it's you can reasonably make assumptions about how long, how long that will take you to to navigate. So programming that in at an early stage will help you in um, in planning for when you can actually start enforcing. Um, we talked about their protected groups, the impact on the wider area of of enforcing um, the restriction or banning the turn or or doing um, the CCTV enforcement in that area. And the final um, sort of top tip is is more looking at if you have existing restrictions on street and you might already have the traffic um, and you want to start enforcing them with, uh, with the cameras just to really make sure you've got those traffic orders right before you start enforcing. Um, and the final slide there is just our, just our contact email addresses. I mean, by all means, keep the conversation going. Oliver and I love talking about this stuff, so by all means, get in touch. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Thank Mike. you, Oliver. Thank you, Ollie. 40 seconds over, Ollie. 40 seconds over. So next up is Andrea Jones from Marson. Over to you, Andrea. So yeah, hi, thanks Mike, uh, and hello everybody. So as Mike said earlier, I'm here to talk to you about key considerations as we approach the implementation of part six for moving traffic enforcement. Um, now I'm sure many of you will have experience of implementing CCTV enforcement schemes um, across your regions, but um, even with some of our most experienced clients, we still continue to work with and support them through difficult to navigate deployments. Uh, there are usually several different teams involved from scheme inception through to responding to PCNs issued and anything can go wrong. So we've tried to pull together what we believe are headline considerations for you to help mitigate those risks. Um, I should add this is not an exhaustive list and I'm not looking to repeat what Ola and Richard have, and Ollie have, have already helpfully explained. Um, sorry, next slide please. So top of the list is ensuring that you have got a strong, consistent message linked to your transport um, strategy, authorities' transport strategy, um, particularly the government gear change document. Um, and they will help to demonstrate the purpose for the scheme that councillors, cabinet members, senior leaders that they're all aligned with. The risk of local opponents challenging new designs, it can see political support waiver and, and, and even derail schemes. So, you know, especially those where they have the benefits um, designed uh, into them uh, for the many. So having this message built into your consultation, your engagement, your traffic order statement of reasons, certainly as just has been explained. Um, press releases and with your communications team, it will support consistent reply to media and resident inquiries and certainly anyone challenging the intention of what you're trying to achieve. Dependent on the scheme, you'll want to ensure that exemptions are clearly identified and they're defined early on for residents and motorists. And as said before, it will be built into your order. It's particularly relevant for school streets and for other areas where some or all motor vehicles are going to be restricted. Um, and you'll need to plan for camera system configuration accordingly. Managing exemptions, either as a permit or in a similar system that interfaces with your camera provider, it can reduce the administrative burden and it can also um, mitigate the risk of PCNs being issued to exempt vehicles. It takes away potential for unwelcome noise and anything that can distract from the scheme's objectives. It does require change control, it can require development, and that can lead to additional time. So it's really important that you seek to understand that early on and build that into your expectations and your timeframes. So once you've got your scheme designed, don't hesitate to contact your camera provider especially if you're implementing AMPR uh, enforcement, so that surveys can be undertaken to design the deployment, ID kit, anticipate um, where if, uh, equipment is going to be installed and ensure that that equipment is earmarked for you. We're at, we are anticipating an increased demand, so early engagement will help you to meet your corporate expectations. The survey will also ID where the camera should go, and unless purpose installed columns are going to be used, most cameras are installed on existing lighting columns, 
This means you do need to liaise with your street lighting teams. They'll hopefully give you approval to use them and organise for commando sockets to be installed before the cameras go up. I've included on here that connecting with the team responsible for your authority's smart city ambitions is important. And that's because to date we have seen some emerging conflict over access to lighting columns and other mounting infrastructure, which is all being earmarked for the installation of IoT devices. So our best advice is make sure you're talking to them. Next slide, please. So it probably goes without saying that it's important to identify your route to procure any new CCTV equipment. There are some forthcoming frameworks, including the Crown Commercial Services Transport, Technology and Associated Services Framework. Speak to your procurement teams though, they can help you to review your existing contracts. And if you'd like to receive on frame, frame advice on frameworks, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch and there'll be contact details shared by Lando at the end of the, of, of the, of the webinar. Frameworks are an option, they're a helpful option. They do offer options for mini competition or direct reward and can save you guys time and cost in terms of your procurement. So once your camera's up and operational, lots of authorities see what we call the bow wave effect. It's increased volumes that, that, that arise when schemes go live um, and they will all obviously still need to be processed. And that helps to ensure that your scheme outcomes are best achieved. No one needs backlog, so and that includes the motorist. And so do think about your current resourcing, whether you have any modeling that suggests resilient support will be needed to maintain timeframes, and seek that out early. Uh, policies for clip review, for cancellations, paragraph templates, statutory notice templates, uh, change control for a PCN system set up, they all need to be planned for in advance. And again, if you need any support, don't hesitate to ask. Beyond that, additional administrative requirements, such as ensuring privacy impact assessments, your Cato agreements with the DVLA and data retention policies, they all need to be up to date and, and, and re reviewed and brought up to date. AMPR camera systems, they do collect a range of data, including vehicle classification, and this can help with policy reviews, measuring scheme outcomes, but importantly, understanding what data is available, what is captured and what is kept, for you, uh, what you may want to do with that uh, in the future. Um, it helps to align it with your data retention policies and any changes that are required to your data retention policies, they can all be planned for in advance. We recognise that local authorities are facing a complex financial landscape. So post pandemic, everything has changed. So do talk to uh, your suppliers um, about different payment options. Leasing, CapEx or a blend of options can be considered to support you. Next slide, please. So really that's it. Um, I do hope it's been helpful. It's been quick, trying to keep on, on to time so that we can get to the q and I've, I've seen that there's a lot of questions coming through. Um, as I said, it wasn't exhaustive, but if you do want to speak to us about any specific needs, then don't hesitate to get in contact. Thanks, Mike. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. So next up, we've got Stuart Scott from Video Alert. So he's got some videos, so hopefully you've sat comfy with your popcorn. Over to you, Stuart. Mike, um, just getting this. I'm sharing screen, um, unlike um, everyone else. So just, just can everyone see? Everyone see that screen? Yep, got you. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm, I'm quickly going to be uh, doing a real uh, quick fire through um, maximising use of VCA certified devices at the edge. Um, and um, topics I'm quickly going to going to run through today is, is to hopefully give a, a blend summary of uh, all applications, um, scenarios uh, where devices are deployed at, uh, linked into the review software, uh, linked to the back office uh, PCN systems that uh, local councils use, along with mobile application. Um, so I will crack on. Um, video yeah, alert. Is um, it, is, Hi. Sorry to interrupt you there, and um, we, we actually can't see your slides at the moment. Um, That's better, perfect. They're on, they're on, better. yeah. Okay. Um, so just a blend of uh, geographic um, clients um, from um, a video perspective, got a length of breadth um, of experience across uh, the national landscape in London. 
uh, and outside of uh, London. Uh, 52 clients um, is our current uh, run rate, um, capturing roughly uh, those numbers in terms of uh, bus lane uh, contraventions, uh, school key clear contraventions, the 400 moving traffic um, contraventions within London, um, 440 clean air zone uh, applications uh, linked to um, this platform on the UTMC and police provision uh, for both two, uh, and we have 35 uh, mobile enforcement vehicle uh, systems uh, deployed. Typical scenarios that um, councils outside of London will, will be used to at, at this time, uh, bus gate uh, deployment, uh, bus lane uh, deployment, School keep clear, uh, automated. This is this is our unique uh, automated uh, unattended uh, software sees a, a stationary object of, the of, of interest and, and homes in uh, and takes that uh, vehicle reg reg registration mark. These these um, applications are, are used widely uh, outside of London um, at, this, at this moment in time. Uh, this is a red route. Uh, this is a uh, this is the first red route outside of London um, and uh, clearly some. Uh, Interesting driver behavioural uh, habits uh, going on uh, in the northwest. Same blended, same software solution, which is used for the school system. A red route system is the same. Well, the unattended capture, PTZ. Now, what what you're going to happen uh, over the next sort of uh, six months or so is is a, a blend of new uh, restrictions will be coming your way. So, uh, yellow uh, box junctions uh, will become uh, applicable. Uh, to uh, enforcement uh, with, with the CCTV devices. Uh, prohibition of driving uh, except sort of access uh, schemes within the urban sort of town centre environments where potentially in the past these were controlled by automated bollards or planters or just signage alone but weren't enforced. Uh, these will become uh, evidently uh, in your uh, gift. Weight restrictions. Um, this is the uh, weight restriction uh, solution uh, outside, of, outside of the school, but clearly for local authorities who have had um, uh, more rural areas with, with problems for villages, that will be uh, within your uh, reach. Band turns, um, that is a uh, coming within your gift. Uh, and this one is a, a multiple uh, scenario capture of a, a banned uh, U-turn um, and uh, motorists uh, trying to avoid uh, being captured and turning a bit further downstream in the hope that they've evaded detection. So there's a blend there of, of what is uh, now going to become your, uh, your, your, your gift and, and what will be uh, able to be applied on the highway for authorities outside of London. Um, we uh, deliver on multiple platforms uh, with Omniv. Always worth bearing in mind uh, which other service areas might use CCTV. So parking services is obviously clearly one area and um, there's public realm safety. Uh, there's the traffic signals, UTMC and, and traffic management divisions within councils. And there's also the police, which um, can be quite interesting in terms of uh, information and data that you capture. We um, like to feel that there's uh, five pillars of, of core functionality uh, with, with a platform uh, should councils uh, choose to deploy. Um, civil traffic enforcement, police NPR, school safety, uh, traffic and parking data and, and uh, linking in with clean air and low emission zones uh, within uh, England and Scotland. We um, have a sophisticated analytics and APR platform um, which detects uh, stationary objects, uh, slow moving objects and, and uh, objects crossing boundaries, uh, which uh, proves where the analytics uh, from a, a capture and accuracy perspective uh, you get right first time. Our, our field equipment is, is a little bit different from uh, other market uh, manufacturers. Um, we have a, a rapidly deployable uh, server at, at the edge, which is typically deployed on a, um, on a column, a lamp column or CCTV column. Um, and you can power up to four uh, camera devices through this one unit, which could do uh, complicated scenario um, enforcement types. Um, and um, we can also link in cameras wirelessly uh, to that device. Uh, we're uh, an accredited on-move supplier. Um, we use access cameras where possible, um, but that doesn't 
uh, mean that we can't use other devices as well should the need arise uh, so we can uh, mix and match uh, where feasible uh, in, in deployment scenarios. Uh, our single uh, RDS, uh, Rapid Deportable Server, uh, can uh, stream up to 12 cameras from one device wirelessly and, and both uh, four connected uh, to the unit itself, um, which helps reduce SIM card costs, but also helps uh, understand uh, what is possible in terms of enforcing a, a very large uh, box junction scenario um, on a typical A, a road or um, a heavy congested corridor. Um, we um, typically can, def as, I, as I mentioned, we can obviously uh, enforce the banter here. Uh, we could do the bus lane enforcement, all, all stream from uh, one device. So uh, should the box junction fall within the uh, brief of this uh, location, uh, that would uh, need an additional NPR camera to look at the trigger area for um, capturing uh, that area also. It's uh, some design considerations in terms of these locations, which um, you'll be uh, looking at uh, in the near future. Now, contravention and capture is one thing. Um, and then uh, what you need to consider then is, is the uh, review software and the review platform, which uh, takes forward the contraventions which have been captured. Um, so typically uh, you will get presented with this contravention. You'd, you'd click on the review image. Um, that would be presented to a secondary screen for uh, the review of the uh, capture. Uh, you could play the video. Um, the stills are also automatically um, presented automatically with a, an automated DBLA lookup uh, to uh, ensure that um, the operated time is maximised as, as quickly as possible, should uh, volumes be of a high level. You click on process, this will set you through to a final screen um, and then you would double check and then click on produce PCN and then that will be then gone to the uh, PCN provider, the back office PCN provider, which uh, we work and uh, integrate with with all the uh, market leaders. Um, your standard review client, so platform, uh, you have a bus lay in the top left, you have a bus uh, stop. Uh, clearway, box junction, mobile car and, and school zone. Um, so you can see the all types of contraventions are captured under the same platform. Uh, also, um, it's useful to know about fault management, making sure that your systems, whichever you choose to uh, look at, have a, a, a good fault management system and an uptime uh, compliance rating to make sure that your maximum um, return on investment to make sure that your compliance levels and your reduced um, uh, accident statistics or improved air quality actually uh, come out with a meaningful uh, solution. Hosting infrastructure, uh, we operate um, a hosted environment along with the premise, um, but uh, our hosting environment uh, runs um, from uh, the mobile car application to static camera on street, uh, back to the uh, evidence pack for operator review uh, to, the, to the PCN back office system. Our hosted infrastructure, we, we run out of two data centres. Uh, we've got a dual replication backup should one uh, data centre fail. They're uh, both UK based in, in London. Um, and we've got a third uh, emergency uh, additional disaster recovery site uh, where our offices in Pinner, uh, should the need arise, uh, should any of those um, two data centres fail. But uh, they are uh, data uh, level three centres uh, and they host some of the national infrastructure. Um, uh, they've, uh, they've, they've stepped the good have the good test of time today so um, uptime is is proven um, I also just want to briefly touch on uh, mobile car and bike applications because um, there's a lot of uh, thought process with councils at the minute surrounding uh, focus on static cameras however uh, it's interesting to note that uh, mobile cars uh, applications can be used for the part six powers as well. Uh, we developed the Stingray device um, over the uh, past 12 months that's deployed in, in unattended mode. We've now expanded into the attended market around about eight months ago um, where uh, and we've now got an electric scooter uh, in unattended mode which which is utilized in the um, urban um, areas um, and we've also got a demo van uh, which can have uh, people sat at the back to have a play around with the screen um, and uh, what the solutions look like. Um, this is the unattended capture uh, route um, in terms of um, uh, just not, not stopping, uh, automatically capturing a vehicle uh, on, on that type of contravention. Um, however, 
the I, I think I do think there's a blend of there's a hybrid blend for councils to look at um, attended mode uh, for vehicles on the basis of um, attended availability for part six enforcement. So should should councils be thinking about mobile car applications, then uh, clearly um, unattended can work. But for part six in terms of minimising risk for return investment, then having an attended option there would mean that that could also be effective in working in different types of uh, moving traffic enforcement locations as well. Um, there's an electric car option um, available um, that has a 50 kilowatt battery, uh, 270 mile range, as we're clearly thinking about uh, the green agenda uh, as it stands going forward with the uh, transition to electric vehicles. The applications and the products you've seen uh, today uh, are all VCA manufacturers certifi certified um, and uh, approved in Scotland. Um, that's something you need to bear in mind as well in terms of uh, locations of uh, where these cameras are to be deployed at and making sure that the VCA manufacturer certification is uh, up, to, up, to, up to standard. And finally, um, the camera data uh, which uh, is available to you can be presented in a number of formats. Um, the typical uh, dates, uh, data available could, could, could all be from CO2 bandings to type of vehicle, uh, to fuel type, to Euro status. Um, this helps inform really what your deployment schedules could be and actually how the informing compliance in terms of not only um, driving down um, kill seriously injured but actually uh, if uh, a local authorities have got any air quality um, improvement areas then that can hopefully improve and inform those areas as well uh, clearly for members and officers data is is key um, and uh, this helps pull that together for you um, and um, that was um, yeah that's that's all that's a quick um, run through uh, today clearly I've uh, not been uh, able to delve in any great detail but hopefully a quick, a quick overview that's that's informed um, the audience uh, today thank you Joe. some truly wonderful video clips that you sent of appalling driving so last and as I said before by no means least it's now Philip Hall assistant director from London Borough of Barnet over to you Phil oh, thanks Mike <clears throat> um, so wrapping up quickly um, and and taking you wearing these headphones as if you're as air traffic controller gliding you quickly down um, so we've heard a lot today um, about how you do this the technology potential pitfalls um, but these only set well in the strategic context and um, from my experience in in london local government um, you know this technology and this enforcement has grown into itself um, and credibility has reinforced its applicability and with that comes the creativity. So really quick potted history on my view about kind of how things have evolved. I saw it potentially as, as a quite niche solution a decade ago for a few busy central London locations. It wasn't clear that there was going to be a wider estate outside of these areas. You had lots of manual enforcement. Um, individual sites were you know, bringing in some money, but it wasn't clear that you'd ever have a business case for, for, for a broader offering. Um, somewhere like London Borough of Barnet goes from some of the most very urban areas you can find in London, all the way out to Greenbelt village-like areas. And, and it was clear obviously that the police had stopped um, or were not able to support the level of ambition that you might have had for some of this enforcement. So you kind of there's a tension here about is it applicable, how do you do some of this enforcement, what's its usability? And I see where we've got to now, and we've had it clearly demonstrated how you'll get there as well. You know, it can be cost effective, the different routes to ownership, it can be redeployable, um, used in, it's got a range of capabilities, you know, that you can use it for. And the, these are distinctly different needs with one common source, which is vehicles doing things they're not expected to do. Addressing that is a really fundamental aspect of this technology. And, and it, you know it's scalable it's something that can be just a couple of locations initially and then go on to be you know you're bringing out batches of dozens of, of sites in in one go in, in barnet there's well over well over 100 of these sites and i certainly see that there's more opportunities as we go on and it's now accepted you know we, we, it's not a novelty um in barnet it's 50 percent of, of everything that we do so these things are getting more in, embedded but for me, it's about where the opportunities lie about this. Um, 
particularly around the strategic ambitions of the council. So for us, it, it, it has given us the, the kind of the teeth that fulfills our promises to residents, to businesses, other stakeholders and partners, whether they be in the public or the private sector. And that's because we can we can say, you know, if if this is built, if these decisions around how traffic flows or traffic doesn't flow or where vehicles are or are not permitted are agreed, we can then actually deliver on the enforcement. Um, that's something that obviously without those powers um, or with a, a, a limitation in those in the resourcing of those powers, for example, via the police, you simply didn't have. And that gives so much more credibility to a whole range of decision making that is centered around the highways. You know, unlocking major generation regeneration schemes that we've had, such as Brink Cross South, um, next to the North Circular, Collindale, lots of lots of areas within the borough that are seeing up to 50,000 new new houses um, come into come into the borough. So um, this has given us a lot more options as well about redesigning our high streets, whether that's to focus on the economic support for businesses or the walking and cycling towards their enabling community events and to use more attractive designs to balance the desires of different road users who had been traditionally in tension and where, if I'm honest, I suspect most of the time it, it fell in the favour of people who had a car. Um, and, and so you can enable other uses without necessarily having to um, lose that accessibility by car and that's because you've got the much more nuanced technology that can you know do different times of the day different times of the year um, and be very flexible and responsive responsive to what you need locally and that can even be hyper responsive in local situations where you're kind of finessing down to the you know individual permit holders and speaking to residents on an almost one-to-one -one basis where it, when it comes to things like school streets um, so that lets you bring in major controls but have an impact that is not disproportionately on a few heads and I think, you know, as we come into the post-COVID economy, that, that gives us a real opportunity around travel patterns. Um, you know, there's going to be different travel patterns, economic patterns, pressures on walking and cycling as well as on the highway. It supports our blue light colleagues and bus services and similar by meaning that we can put many more restrictions into a kind of virtual state rather than needing physical barriers. I'm noticing a lot more removal of gates um, ar around London, and I think that's probably very welcome for, for those, those services. Um, it has an a financial impact as well and that's beyond the the potential for a PCN income to bring you some some um, you know short-term financial gain uh, that does happen but it also means that you can unlock partners funding streams because you can bring in more developments that wouldn't otherwise be viable or, or credible you can therefore get things like sill receipts you can increase your business rates you can increase council tax payers that are that are, that are within your areas so the the opportunity for this it starts to snowball and it really has um, for us, you know, we can make commitments and, and, and have obligations placed upon us and, and build ourselves into to a range of different decision making that the council has. So we're not just a, a parking and enforcement service, but we actually find ourselves integrating into strategic planning, into town centres and economic regeneration, the growth strategy, as well as, of course, our, our kind of long term transport strategies, all of which have been predicated on the powers and the abilities of, of this technology and of, of the ability to deploy it within the urban context of London. And I think, you know, there'll be a lot of places around the UK uh, where that will be very welcome. And, and it doesn't just have to be about, you know, cars moving this way or that way. It, it's, it's about thinking, how do you link your town centres, your parks, your open spaces, your schools and your transport facilities? How are you going to do school travel planning in a much more meaningful way? Because that's, you know, obviously a major problem for all of us is the, the school, school rush out. How do you, how can you address that? Well, you know, if you've got more credibility in the enforcement element, all the other systems that are interlinked with it um, can, can, can come forward in their prominence. Bus journey time improved being a major one, I'd say. Um, and when you can start to leverage these things, you'll also be able to be more successful for external bids um, for funding, you know, whether that's the DFT or the TFL equivalents, and also funding streams from the private sector, developments, planning and regeneration. And you become a credible partner for delivery of those businesses. And that, that, that then lets the developers themselves be more nuanced and more creative in what they put forward in their developments because they know that you're a partner that they can work with. 
So for me, I mean, the experience is that this continues to build and build the opportunities that you have. You can be more imaginative in terms of use of the highway, and it supports the journeys of everyone and the place of the highway in terms of health, economic well-being, growth, and the lives of, of, of all of our citizens, but in, in many cases, the most vulnerable. And I think, for me, that's really what this the, the opportunity here is all about. Yes, the technology needs to work. Yes, we need to make sure that the boxes are ticked, the regulations are correct, and that our citizens are communicated with. But above all, I think it's about what are the opportunities that, that changing the highway and the public realm can achieve. So that's it for me, and thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for that, Phil. Good presentation at the end there to finish for us. We have now got a Mr. Keith Hughes who will be joining us with Richard and the other panelists. So if, the, if all the panelists could please switch your cameras on now. Whilst they're doing that, I'd just like to remind all of the attendees on the webinar that there is a little two minute survey at the end that would be extremely grateful. Land or Wood, if you could complete that survey for them. So we've got a whole raft of questions. They've actually asked me to, to specifically designate these questions to the panellists, which I think is a little bit unfair. I would have liked to have given them no notice whatsoever. So if we can start off with... First question is from Ed Cloudon. Is it possible to use two cameras in sync to measure people using a rat run? So, for example, if a vehicle is captured by two cameras within a fixed amount of time, then they can be fined. So I'm assuming that one's for Stuart or DFT. I can I can pick up Mike if you, you want to. Um, we do we do we have got um, deployments um, within within uh, London at this present time uh, with two cameras uh, measuring distance travelled uh, to inform uh, rat runs. Um, so the, the answer is the answer is yes the technology the technology exists there now uh, it is done now um and that feeds into wider um low traffic neighborhood schemes um and also school streets as well uh, to assist those uh, data and statistics in, and informing what what actually the outcomes of the scheme have been whether successful or whether or not they need to make some minor highway alterations excellent thank you Stuart, and thanks for the question ed uh, next up is Mr. Richard Walker from NEP. I, I, I thought Richard would ask a question. So the question is, does the panel have any views about signage to be placed in advance of restrictions? The restriction might apply at a point, but other information or notification of the ban might be required. But how much? An example might be a prohibition of vehicles, but should a banned turn be placed in advance or would information signage suffice? And that one is to the entire panel from Richard. Who's taking that one? I can take it. So no. I think if I understand the question correctly, uh, any indication that there is a change to existing controls or what people would expect and have known to expect is a positive thing. Ultimately, the, the, the approved signage that indicates the control is, the, is, the, is where the enforcement or where a contravention would occur and where enforcement happens, but it's very much in, uh, aligned with, with what Richard was saying at the outset about making sure that that motorists and that and that residents and citizens are aware that this is happening. This is not meant to trap. It's not meant to surprise people. It's meant to deliver, you know, outcomes to your transport strategy and your network. Very much as Phil was alluding to as well. You know, ultimately, if there is an opportunity to inform and to engage with people to say that there are changes ahead that may not have been there, then you should do it. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, next one is Paul Richard from Richard Firth. Um, are local authorities able to self-certify their TROs and signs as fit for purpose? What is the risk for local authorities if the TROs and signs are not fit for purpose? Is there a threshold for levels of accuracy? Can local authorities specifically target restrictions or areas within designation order or target town centres? Or do they have to deal with the whole area of designation order? Okay, I think uh, it's Richard from DFT. I think I can answer that one. Um, the 
the intention is um, once the local authorities have been designated uh, and they have their whole area designated, it's entirely a matter for the local authority as to the geographic scope of enforcement action, um, as well as the, the, the locations and types of restrictions that they enforce. So uh, from our perspective, there is there, it's an entirely a matter for the local authority. Thank you for that, Richard. Okay, next up is a question from Kevin Hargreaves from TFGM. I suspect this is again for DFT or Stuart. So for additional data capture from ANPR and CCTV, what processes need to be in place to utilise additional data other than the primary purpose? Do you want to go with that one, Mark? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that one. So, so I, I think I think you need to understand what the what the scheme objectives uh, and what it wants to achieve in order to inform what data you exactly want. Um, you, you may have um, a, a scheme where uh, a red route, as an example, may be causing uh, particular bottlenecks on the network, which is in, in increasing air quality levels, uh, meaning increased uh, journey times. Um, and a red route application uh, may mean that proactive enforcement via CCTV technology may mean that the journey times are, re are improved and the air quality emissions are also reduced. And, and in that regard, you may want air quality data and journey time uh, time data to mean uh, how well that, that part and that, that contravention type has, has worked. Um, equally, you may have uh, the need for a school street deployment, which may, you may want to see in terms of over a period of time, an improvement on air quality and, and an improvement on killed seriously injured statistics. Um, and that, those could be quite uh, powerful data sets uh, that you can you can get and, and merge together with your uh, crash map data, for instance, uh, which can uh, really have some positive uh, outcomes uh, and inform uh, members and politicians surrounding uh, the application of these products and, and tools uh, which are going to be available to you. Thank you, Chad. I've got an anonymous one here and it's for Richard. I appreciate this is based around English local authorities. Is there an indication from Welsh, Welsh government that when part six is introduced, will it be aligned with the same time frames as England? Yeah, hi. Um, uh, Keith Hughes here. I'm sitting with Richard. Um, Wales has already got these powers. Um, they're already in, in force in Cardiff and I think Carmarthen, so they're ahead of us. Yeah, and so the rest of Wales, obviously, it's just whenever they choose to take it up, go for it. Indeed, yeah. I mean, if, if another uh, council area in Wales wanted to take up the power, they would approach the Welsh Government um, and presumably get designation order in a similar in the similar way that we're doing in England um, and, and actually a lot of the uh, the regime that applies in Wales so uh, under the actual powers that are in the TMA there's this sort of suite of regulations that forms the whole basis of the enforcement regime the, the Welsh system is already in place and, and our our system will more or less mirror that um, I mean there may be one or two things where there's a difference between England and Wales, but in the main, our, our, our regime will mirror theirs. Um, but yeah, the, but they're ahead of us. I think they've had it since maybe 2013. Yeah, sure. yeah, 2013. So yeah, they've already got it. And and if any other councils in Wales want it, they just apply it to the Welsh government. Thank you. There's a couple on weight limits here. So for a weight limit restriction that covers a broad area. Will a camera be required for each entry point and sighted where the terminal sign is visible? Just, can, sorry, uh, just, just one more on that. There's just one more on weight restriction. How do you how do you prove that they did not gain access within the area? And again, that's another one for the DFT from Mark Youngman. That's from. Uh, okay, I can, I, if I can take the question that the 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 as I understand it, the prescribed list of traffic signs um, will um, will include uh, the, the sign, I forget the diagram number now, but it's for the environmental uh, weight restriction rather than for structural weight uh, limits. 
So, um, and there are no plans to expand the existing list any further. So, uh, the weight limit site um, uh, and for moving traffic enforcement will be for pure, purely for environmental weight limits. Um, and what was the second part of the question again? Sorry. Regarding the weight restriction, how do you prove that they did not gain access within, please? Not, not, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, we can, can we take that one away and give some consideration to that one? I've got so many questions for you. So, um, yeah, this one's I'm been sure. asked times again. So, this is from Rob Lewis. Um, if an authority does apply for a designation order, will the police move away completely or is it a dual enforcement responsibility? It is, yes, dual enforcement. Uh, unlike civil parking enforcement, where um, apart from locations such as um, pedestrian crossings um, where dual enforcement exists and, and, and parking restrictions uh, are taken away from the police, uh, for moving traffic, the police will re will retain enforcement powers. Um, in the highly unlikely event that um, enforcement happens for the exact same offence, then police action would take precedent. Thank you. And one from Mark Strong. Thank you, Mark. Will advanced stop line infringements be enforceable? No. <laughs> Short and sweet. Okay, let's move on from Rachel Lee. So quite a few people have asked, are the actual slides available? I know that the, the presentations will be, so we'll, we'll get Landor to come back to you on that one, Rachel. And she's also asked, is there any scope to apply a moving traffic offence to someone cycling or e-scooting on a pavement? All, all I can say is, the, 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 the remit we have and what ministers have committed to is to introduce moving traffic for uh, the existing prescribed signs in the, in the Traffic Management Act. Um, the, we, we couldn't answer that. Uh, that's a wider policy consideration with regard to e-scooters. Um, so we, we certainly couldn't offer a view on that at this point. Okay. Uh, a question from Derek Twig. Can the letter from the chief exec cover the whole network as a policy rather than scheme by scheme? Uh, yes, if the, if, if the chief executive letter will be an application for um, um, designation for the whole council area. So within, within that, um, it, again, it's a matter for the local authority um, how they enforce. So, yes, it's effectively a blanket designation. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get some other questions for the other panellists here. But they're all, as you'd expect, DFT top heavy. Um, so a question from Richard O'Malley. Will local authorities need to revoke their powers under Section 144 of the Transport Act 2000? We talk, we're talking about bus lane enforcement yeah. um, in, the, in that respect. Um, the, policy, the policy which is yet to be absolutely confirmed is to um, amalgamate um, bus lane enforcement under the TMA um, and revoke the, the Section 144 powers. That still, I must stress, that that still remains subject to final ministerial agreement um, but if so, then yes, we as we as the, uh, the the act originally intended, the three parking, bus lane, and moving traffic um, enforcement regimes would come under the Traffic Management Act. Uh, any camera certification uh, relating to um, bus lane parking, bus lane um, enforcement would remain extant. Um, so, yes, but that, that still remains subject to final ministerial agreements. Okay, thank you. And a question from Mo Khan. What happens if you want to introduce a phased approach to introducing MTO? Would you need to go through the six-week notification period every time you incorporate additional junctions? 
Uh, another short answer, um, yes, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, chief executives will be expected to commit to going through the, the, the processes um, outlined in the slide um, for a future for future expansion of uh, enforcement activity. Thank you. And one from Mr. Mike James from Bristol. Will the restrictions placed on postal PCNs by Mr. Pickles be withdrawn? Now that, that's a parking matter. Um, and the, the situation as, as stands as introduced in 2015 with regard to limiting CCTV usage, uh, that's, that's beyond the scope of this exercise. So that will remain as it is. Okay. And Richard O'Malley again. Will the guidance cover the use of CCTV enforcement vehicles as well as fixed cameras and potentially allow parking in contravention to enforce? I'm not, not quite sure of the question. If you can make a note of that and can we take it away and answer it? Of course. Um, Peter yeah. Bell. Are the TPT set up for the potential increase in appeals that will occur at launch and beyond? So, so I can answer that one. We, we, I think Mike is something that we need to have a chat with uh, with the BPA about. To start engaging the TPT. I'm sure they're they're aware of of the the impending legislative changes and what that means for adjudicators um, but it would be helpful to have some direct engagement with them from from the BPA or someone similar to to, to reinforce that message well, I know yeah, been... uh, sorry go on so, sorry Keith Hughes here from DFT yeah we, we've been in touch with um, the adjudicator and the officials in um, TPT uh, throughout this process, so they're, they're fully up to speed on, on what's going on, and I think they're sort of prepared for this. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I was just about to say the BPA are obviously on this webinar. I'm sure Kelvin's chomping at the bit to speak, but he's, he's obviously muted. Sorry, Kelvin. And there will be another webinar from the BPA on this subject in the autumn. So sorry for that shameless plug there, Mr. Moran. Um, one from Rob Shoebridge from Derby. For clarity, once the initial public consultation has taken place with the proposed locations, will it be necessary to consult with the public on each occasion new locations are going to be enforced? Um, yeah, I think I think that was a question, a similar question to the one that was uh, asked earlier. So yes, I mean in, in the initial application, um, so if the council uh, applies for a designation order at the outset and they're preparing to introduce you know a certain number of box junctions maybe some bad turns the, the letter that comes from their chief exec will confirm that they've done the points in the uh, slide that Richard noted I think they were A to F or something but, but subsequently any time a council um, in the future and it could be months or years later you know that if they want to add further camera, new camera enforcement, um, they will be expected to go through those steps and that will be um, included in the statutory guidance because um, I think what uh, ministers wouldn't want is um, some publicity up front when the regime first goes live, but later on, if new camera enforcement happens at new sites, you know, a year later or something, for motorists to be sort of caught unaware at that point, they want you know, whenever camera enforcement is, is started for um, residents and businesses in the area, um, motorists to know what, what's happening, um, so there's no surprises. Okay, thank you. Can local highway authorities use these powers to enforce against HGVs using inappropriate routes if covered by appropriate TROs? There is the environmental weight uh, limit sign. Um, six, I believe I forgot earlier. I believe it's diagram six two two one a. Um, so that that regulatory sign would be civilly enforceable. Um, if if the question re refers to the blue 
uh, uns unsuitable for heavy goods vehicle sign. That's that's an informatory sign, and that would not be subject to civil enforcement in itself. But the regulatory sign is. Okay, I've got I've got a couple on schools now. Um, how can you use these within a, within school streets area to capture parent traffic restricted under ETRO whilst allowing legitimate access to residents, visitors, uh, local businesses within the school street restricted area? And as a continuation of that, Rob, again from Derby, Rob Shoebridge has asked, with the unattended camera software, so this one's for Stuart, how many contraventions can the camera capture at once? For example, if a vehicle stops on the school keep clears and three other vehicles stop, can it record each one simultaneously or does the camera go through the same routine in terms of going through its evidence gathering cycle before it moves on to vehicle number two? So would the attended camera also record an image if a vehicle was given away? For example, the school crossing patrol is stopped and the vehicle was held on the markings. So there's a couple there for you, Stuart slash DFT. Want me to go first, Mike? Yeah. 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 Okay, if you go first. Okay, Richard. Um, so the the unattended software application is is meant for um, compliance improvement around schools. It is um, not meant for um, a sort of uh, revenue objectives, albeit the revenue um, aspects for compliance are, are can be quite um, can be quite uh, uh, obviously. Uh, high. Um, the ultimately, what what we do with the unattended solution is that we concentrate on minimising the revenue councils have to uh, put into a scheme with having uh, operators sat uh, by a desk, uh, having to look at real time footage um, and go through that um, either in real time or, or post real time, and then uh, modifying the video to to catch where contraventions occur. The un the unattended solution is is a uh, unmanned solution where the software captures a vehicle of interest uh, and uh, there are compliance matrix matrices where where that solution uh, has been uh, deployed in, in, a, in a, a lot of councils and the uh, improvements in air quality and the improvements in killed seriously injured statistics have been significant um, subsequently the return on investment without the need for any uh, operators or manned attendees uh, viewing the footage is 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 clearly uh, a lot more uh, in terms of uh, the return on investment. So uh, that that is the unattended uh, unattended solution. But equally, um, there are areas and locations uh, where some 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 people may may require other different solutions. Um, that the, the these solutions uh, are, are, might not be a one fit one fit size size for all. Um, so you'll have to look at your locations depending on solution requirements, uh, which will inform your uh, VCA certified devices uh, to be deployed up. Thanks, Stuart. Come on. Okay, just from the DFT perspective, um, the, the permitted variants um, applicable to the pedestrian zone signing, which I understand is for use with st school streets, um, will provide the necessarily necessary flexibility um, to allow, as you say, common sense access um, to school streets areas um, and just to add that any technical from the DFT point of view any technical queries regarding um, camera equipment should be directed to the VCA. Thank you for that Richard. Uh, more of an observational comment from here the person remains anonymous. Um, the consultation is not inclusive especially with age. The consultation nowadays are carried out via emails or website. Therefore, elder people who do not have these facilities are missing out. A paper consultation should still be encouraged. I'm, I'm not expecting an answer from that, Richard. I just thought I'd let you know that somebody's asked me to say that to you. Well, we could we could just say that we're not, you know, we certainly don't prescribe how uh, a local authority reaches out to its um, to its constituents. So, you know, there's nothing ruling out. Um, um, reaching out to people by the post. Thank you. And a question from Jeff Hitslop. Can you use part six for moving traffic offences in off street locations? Um, 
No, the, 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 uh, sorry for the straightforward answer. No, um, the, the, the signs that the, the signs that are prescribed are for use on street, uh, and, and that's the, the restriction. Yeah. Um, is the onus on the council to prove that a vehicle has breached an environmental weight limit, or for the vehicle to prove that it had an exemption to use the road? Anyone want to say that one? No, moving on. Um, currently, this is from Ed Plowden. Currently, there are flying motorbike signs, no access to all vehicles about 800 metres apart in a residential road where residents need access from both points. How will you deal with that? Can you just repeat that question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I would only put am I on mute? No, no. I, would, I could only point to the traffic signs manual, um, chapter three, that, that should provide advice on that. Um, we, we couldn't provide the, um, sort of location specific advice on traffic signing as we are here. So um, please do contact our traffic signing team. Um, Sally Gibbons' team, if, uh, if there are any specific queries in that respect. Okay, thank you. I'm going to wind it up shortly. So I've got one from Tim on It's another weight one. As TMA was written quite some time ago, what updates are being considered, e.g. structural weight limits? There are far more vexing than environmental limits and are needed to protect the structural assets where issues can have a massive network impact. Uh, while, while we couldn't rule out that, um, any addition to the list of uh, prescribed signs, um, this is not something that ministers have committed to at this point. So uh, while we can never say never, um, really, at, th at this stage, we are confined to introducing the powers um, as listed. OK, I've got two more. One from Jim Whiting. Will there be a recommended period for warning notices? This is still yet to be decided uh, by ministers. Uh, we're hoping to be able to get uh, a final decision on this soon, um, but we couldn't say at the moment. OK, and the final one goes from Brian Malcolm. It's again on warning notices. Um, they were obviously mentioned at the start of the, the presentation. We get challenged by people who state they should have received a warning notice or they had a friend who received a warning notice. I would prefer that legislation doesn't make warning notices mandatory, but it leaves it up to individual authorities to set the procedure. What do you think of that one, Richard? Uh, well, warning notices are not included in the regulations. Um, they, they are only going to be referred to in statutory guidance, which I appreciate that local authorities must still uh, require. Um, what I'd say about warning notices is uh, this is something that ministers are very keen on um, and it's something of a, um, a, a red line for them. So, uh, yes, it, 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 as, as a condition of introducing the powers, it's something that ministers are keen to, to have. Excellent. Well, I'd, I'd like to personally thank both of you guys from the DFT and all of the panellists uh, for joining today's call. Um, over 500 people, which is fantastic, and we're finishing on time, which is rare. Um, it, it could be a minefield for people, but it looks like everybody's in this together just by the sheer number of people that have come on this call. So it's good that we're all joining up, and it's hopefully going to make this easier. As Phil said, this is not about PCN income. Short term, you might get that. It's more about increased opportunities within your boroughs. Um, and just follow, obviously, advice from the DFT. This is a constantly evolving uh, situation. Landor and BPA are constantly in dialogue with DFT. So as soon as we hear any more, we'll obviously get back to everybody on this conference. So thank you for your time, everybody.